welcome to Material Girls, a pop culture podcast that uses critical theory to understand the zeitgeist. I'm Marcel Cosman. And I'm Hannah McGregor. And you know, if I'm hosting an episode, it's either because I'm plugging a book I've written or (laughs) I've insisted that we have a guest who I'm fascinated by. And luckily for everyone today, it's the latter. (laughs) So, Jesse Meadows, pronouns they, them, is a writer, artist, and creator of a weekly newsletter called Sluggish, which focuses on disability, capitalism, and culture. Welcome, Jesse. Thank you. I'm excited. So we're going to be talking today about the way contemporary self-improvement influencer culture has gotten really obsessed with the neurotransmitter dopamine, and we have so much to say about it. So we're going to have to keep this opening real tight. But folks, I really want to know, since we're talking about self-help and wellness scams, if you've ever gotten sucked into a wellness scam. I know I have. Jesse, you want to start us off? Yeah, I um, took mushroom pills for my depression for a while. (laughs) Not like fun, like the fun kind, but just like lion's mane. I don't know. It was like a mix of mushrooms and a supplement because my therapist had like recommended me to this like naturopath. Mm. I was trying to take psych meds and they weren't working and I was like, I don't know what to do. And she was like, maybe try like natural medicine. And I did try them. And I was like, I believed in them. You know, I was like, I have, everything's going to be okay because I have my mushroom pills and I would like take them with me everywhere, like in my bag. (laughs) But they did not in the long run end up working. So I went back to Uncle Sam's government medicine. I love your emotional support mushroom pills just coming everywhere with you. (laughs) Like as long as I've got these mushrooms on me, we'll be fine. Marcel, what about you? It's tricky because my mom runs a health food store. And so (laughs) I, I have been long familiar with a lot of cuckoo bananas, different kinds of health and wellness scams. Mm -hmm. Some of them I'm still really into, right? Like when I feel a cold coming on, I get hard into oil of oregano. Oh, yeah, same. You know? It hurts, so it must be working. Exactly, right? Right? I think maybe homeopathy is probably the one that I tried and then really turned against really hard. Like, like (laughs) this is bullshit and I'm angry that I ever wasted time and money on these sugar pills. I was also raised by hippies and homeopathy was a major part of the landscape of my childhood medical treatment. I've spent a lot of years trying to cure my panic attacks with Rescue Remedy. Oh, and, um, I am bless, familiar with Rescue Remedy. Bless you, Rescue Remedy, but you, you got nothing on Zoloft. Is that like essential oils or something? Or it's like a tincture? A tincture. It's a tincture. A mm-hmm. tinctures, yes. And like <laughs> one of the main ingredients is grape alcohol. So it's like you're taking a microscopic amount of booze. <laughs> a tiny <laughs> shot. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I always use for my panic attacks. So. <laughs> Till I discovered Clonopin, which, yeah, you're right, works way better. <laughs> Our first segment, as always, is Why This, Why Now?, wherein we ask the materialist question, what are or were the historical, ideological, and material conditions for our object of study to become zeitgeisty? And today we are talking about how a humble little neurotransmitter called dopamine made its way into the zeitgeist. But I suspect we might want to start by talking about what dopamine actually is before we get too far into the made up nonsense about what people think it is. So, Jesse, you're a dopamine expert. Could you start us off with a little dopamine 101 explainer? Yeah, just disclaimer, I am not an expert. I am just a writer that has like, you know, obsessive tendencies. And I have been reading about this and researching it for a while. But yeah, scientists feel free to like fact check me. (laughs) We do consider people who have exhaustively researched things to be experts. Cool. I'm an expert, I guess. So dopamine is a neurotransmitter, which is a chemical that transmits impulses between neurons in the brain. It's how the neurons communicate with other neurons, but also like other cells in your body. So like muscles and stuff. It's actually one of the oldest in evolutionary terms. It's been found in like all kinds of organisms across time. So it's very important. 
most neurotransmitters have multiple functions and dopamine does actually a lot of things, but its function depends like where in the brain it is and which of the five dopamine receptors it's activating. So it's very complex and it's involved in stuff like movement, motor control, attention, learning, motivation, lactation. Oh. The majority of cognitive processes in mammals actually involve dopamine in some way. So I do think it makes a lot of sense that it's become this like pop culture phenomenon just because like if you're talking about some aspect of cognition, dopamine is very likely involved in that. Jesse, just out of curiosity, what got you so interested in dopamine anyway? Well, I have ADHD or I guess ADHD, as the kids are saying. Um, And I was making a lot of content about it on Instagram for a while. And I got really interested in critical ADHD studies, which is an emerging field that looks at it kind of more like socially, politically. And I noticed that like a lot of ADHD influencers who were more like wellness adjacent, kind of like self-help, they had this tendency to talk about dopamine like it was a drug that your brain makes that like controls you. Mm -hmm. And I'm also really interested in drug history and just drugs in general. So I recognize this as like a huge trope from 20th century anti-drug propaganda. Mm. There's this tendency in pop culture to sort of reduce ADHD down to a chemical level. So people will say, you know, it's just a dopamine deficiency. And then the way that you treat ADHD is just learning how to manage your dopamine. And I thought this was really interesting because it's not really how I think about disability in general. Mm -hmm. It's relational, it's political. Um, The designer Sarah Hendren says that it's how your body meets the built world. Mm. But yeah, this oversimplification of dopamine has really taken over. And I first noticed it in ADHD spaces, but now it's really like everywhere. Okay. So I feel like I'm learning for the first time that despite what TikTok says, despite what everybody says, dopamine isn't just your brain's pleasure chemical. There's more to it than that. It is not. Okay. And do neuroscientists know this? Because they haven't told me. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, the neuroscientists, I think, are pretty frustrated about it. Okay. And they have known for a really long time. They call it the dopamine pleasure hypothesis. It was introduced in 1980 by a Canadian scientist named Roy Wise. Not so wise, Roy. (laughs) Well, he did revise his theory, like, By the late 90s, he was like, no, actually, I don't think pleasure is directly related to the amount of dopamine in your brain. And then subsequent studies found that you don't actually need it to feel pleasure. You do need it to like want things. (laughs) So now we're in this era of like wanting, not liking. And that's how it's usually explained. The the science word for that is incentive salience. Basically, just like you want something and you're going to go get it. Yeah. From like everything I was reading, it has more to do with like reward, like your brain pursuing reward rather than pleasure, incentive rather than feeling good. Yeah. And the salience part of that is like, what is important? Like, what should you pay attention to? And so that's why like it plays a big role in learning. We'll be like, hey, look at this thing. Go like pay attention to this thing. And then you like learn habits and just learn in general. Mm -hmm. Okay, wait. So just to clarify, So dopamine is about wanting, not about pleasure. And so when you don't have dopamine, you don't feel incentivized or it's harder to be incentivized to do things. Mm -hmm. That's like the current conceptualization of it. I would make a prediction, though, that like this is going to change because Mm -hmm. just looking at like the history of science and like dopamine in particular, like it's always progressing and we're like learning new things. Yeah. So it's constantly being updated. And I think like a big problem with this in pop culture is that people talk about it as if it's like, we know this now and this is like Mm. the final word on this thing instead of being like some studies suggest or like we think. Yeah. We'll get more into this in a bit, but I think a lot of this has to do with fMRIs and the way that neurotransmitters show light up in our brains Mm -hmm. in a way that makes people go like, well, that's cool. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Yeah, I also think that a lot of us just really like to have 
rational answers to the mysteries of our lives, especially when it's like about our pain and suffering. And in marketing, they talk about like pain points. That's like marketing 101. If you want to sell shit, you like, what's the pain point? Mm. And then they provide a solution to huh. that. So the idea that dopamine is a problem in your life or that it's the thing that causes all the problems in your life and you can fix that by just learning to manage it by doing like X, Y, and Z. It's just a really useful sales tactic. A hundred percent. So when we're trying to understand how dopamine entered the zeitgeist, we've got to understand like wellness and productivity influencer culture, because that's a big part of how it gets sort of marketed as the thing that is wrong with your brain that you can fix through these three easy steps. And to understand that, I think we also need to talk a little bit about the relationship between Silicon Valley and tech bro culture and practices like biohacking, because that's where a lot of this idea that you can like hack your own brain emerges from. So, Marcel, I'm wondering if you could please read this paragraph from an extremely unsettling article in The Guardian about millionaire and billionaire biohackers, please. I'd do anything for you, Hannah. Quote, Serge Fegwe intends to live forever, merging with robots and becoming an ultra-human. If that goal sounds creepy, laughable, or unrealistic, it's helpful to remember that it is one shared by many influential figures in Silicon Valley. Tesla's Elon Musk has repeatedly argued that humans need to become cyborgs to survive the inevitable robot uprising and hopes to usher in an era of transhumanism with his new brain-computer interface company, Neuralink. Bill Maris, founder and former CEO of Google Ventures, the search giant's venture capital arm, went on to launch Calico, an acronym for California Life Company, the sole aim of which is to solve death. Last November, Sean Parker, the former Facebook president, described his vision of the future thus, because I'm a billionaire, I'm going to have access to better health care. So I'm going to be like 160 and I'm going to be part of this class of immortal overlords. As much as Fegwe likes to think of himself as a rebel pioneer, he's an emblem of a far wider movement in the wealthy world he inhabits. End quote. Wow. Wow. Pretty creepy, huh? Wow. Horrifying. So that article is from 2018, which is the same year as the video that is generally linked to the rise of dopamine hacking. So Jesse, what can you tell us about the YouTube channel Improvement Pill and the viral video, How Do You Get Your Life Back Together? Dopamine Fast. Yeah, so Improvement Pill is a YouTuber that makes content for aspirational young men. When you look at his required reading list, it's like how to win friends and influence people and rich dad, poor dad, which are kind of like seminal texts in the neoliberal self-help lit world. Seminal is, I would normally veto that word, but it's very appropriate here. <laughs> For listeners, it comes from the word <laughs> semen. <laughs> um, he does claim to have invented dopamine fasting in the video, but I think that he was just kind of like having the same idea as other like similar dudes around the same time. The idea that you can like reset your dopamine levels if you abstained from pleasure had been kind of floating around like self-improvement message boards for a long time. And it was already a practice that these like high performing startup guys in Silicon Valley were into. Okay. So one solid connection to tech bros. Absolutely. Two, this does kind of remind me about all the myths that we used to, I don't know, people might still circulate them, but like, I feel like when I was a teenager and learning about my body being able to experience pleasure, there was a lot of like, oh, but if you have an orgasm using a vibrator, you won't be able to have an orgasm with your penis partner or whatever. And anyway, sounds like the same thought process. Pleasure is dangerous. Pleasure is dangerous. And you should only be able to do it with another person. Otherwise, you'll never be able to do that with another person because the only appropriate way to do that is with this particular other person. <laughs> I digress. Let's go back to the dude bros. There's a really good piece about this in Mel Magazine from 2019. It's called Are the Tech Bros Who Dopamine Fast Full of Shit? Which like 
yes and no, I would say. Great title. Okay. The classic answer. They sort of like trace the origins back to an ebook called A 40 Day Dopamine Fast by a Canadian guy who says that he wrote the book while he was living in Cambodia and drinking too much, which like if you know anything about like expat in Southeast Asia culture, like really tracks. Yeah. And this is a common theme. Improvement Pill is also framing the dopamine fastest way. He was like, I was partying too much in college, so I invented this ritual so I could get my shit back together. And I love that he says the word ritual because I think that's like a key word. Yeah. A lot of what's appealing about dopamine fasting is this like ritual aspect of it. It's very similar to ascetic practices and like all kinds of religions, but it's like a secular ritual for men who love science, right? Dopamine fasting, a secular ritual for men who like science. You should publish that book. You're going to make so much money, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> No, but like a lot of this wellness stuff is just self-care, but it has to be framed in this way for men. So it's like hard and like rational and looking at the science and doing what the science says. But really, it's just like you need a break. You need you're overstimulated. You're overwhelmed. You need a break. (laughs) You don't have to make up all this stuff about your neurotransmitters. (laughs) A lot of us party too hard in college, dude. Yeah. (laughs) Stop drinking for a week. So it is like importantly... It also is not what's happening. When you take a break, you're not dopamine fasting, right? Like That's a misunderstanding of how dopamine works. Yeah, no, it's not really possible because you need it to move. So (laughs) (laughs) if you didn't have any dopamine, you would just be like stuck. And that's what happens when like they've done experiments blocking dopamine fully. And yeah, like you just can't move. It's also like Parkinson's, all the, the tremors of Parkinson's are dopamine dysfunction. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So there are different versions of this. So Improvement Pill was really strict about it. He was like, you can't have any fun. You can't listen to music. You can't read books. Don't talk to your friends. Basically just like sit in a room and do nothing. And in 2019, a less strict version of this went viral on LinkedIn by a psychologist named Dr. Cameron Sipa. And he is an executive psychologist is what he calls himself. He coaches like CEOs in the Bay Area. He also runs a company called Maximus, where he sells supplements that help men optimize their testosterone. He tried to add some more like reason, I guess, rationality to the practice. He was like, yes, this is just a metaphor. You can't actually fast from an endogenous brain chemical that you need to function. It's just an exercise in stimulus control. And he was like, just focus on the stimuli that have become a problem for you, not like all stimuli in general, because that's not possible. (laughs) I think I understand how dopamine fasting fits into biohacking and why it would get taken up by optimization influencers and especially tech bros. But does that make it zeitgeisty? I'd say no. That makes it like a niche interest. Um, And from my reading, and Jesse, you're as established the expert here, so feel free to disagree with me on this. But I think the thing that takes dopamine from niche to mainstream is probably Anna Lemke's 2021 book, Dopamine Nation, Finding Balance in the Age of Indulgence, because it's like a huge bestseller pop science book that really spreads. Like we see it getting reviewed and taken up at tons of mainstream media outlets. Um, now, Jesse, you have a whole newsletter summarizing and critiquing this book, but I've taken the liberty of pasting the TLDR section from the end of that post here, and I thought maybe you could read it and then we can just unpack it together. Quote, Dopamine Nation is a hedonic Calvinist manifesto that uses federally funded research on the neuroscience of drug addiction and behavioral economics to argue that pleasure is a limited resource that always carries a physiological price and that the way to treat addiction is to tighten social rules and become more vigilant in our own self-management. Lemke's history of prohibitionist activism and experience as a medical professional who previously wrote a book describing some of her disabled patients as drug-seeking malingerers informs the conservative worldview of Dopamine Nation, which is marked by a fear of deviance and seeks to normalize readers through scientific rationality and self-help strategies, lest they become free riders on society. The book expresses cultural anxieties about becoming soft, 
and can be seen as an example of what sociologist Robert Crawford has argued about health practices becoming a way to manage a contradiction of capitalism, the inner conflict between work and pleasure, end quote. Oh, so I, for one, would like to spend some time talking about Lemke and her work as the medical director of Stanford Addiction Medicine and her links to the National Institute on Drug Abuse and its stance on addiction. Jesse, what can you tell us about Dr. Anna Lemke? Yeah, so she is a psychiatrist and a professor at Stanford, which is in a wealthy suburb of San Francisco called Palo Alto. Actually, a couple of the patients she features in Dopamine Nation are Silicon Valley tech bros. So I think that context is really important to understand because the book is sort of trying to diagnose all of society's problems and even like climate change, she says at one point, is caused by pleasure-seeking hedonism. Um, But she's writing from a very particular class position and she's also drawing on a lot of research funded by the U.S. National Institute on Drug Abuse or NIDA. I don't say that to be like conspiratorial. Federal funding is like one of the main sources for medical research and drug development. So it's not surprising to me, but it did give me somewhere to start looking to answer this zeitgeist question. So like very briefly. Like what is Nita up to? Yeah, Nita has considered addiction to be a chronic relapsing brain disease since at least the 1980s. And in the 90s, the U.S. government declared the decade of the brain, which was like basically just a public commitment to fund more neuroscience research. And George Bush Sr. actually said explicitly in a speech in 1990 that he hoped this would help the government with their war on drugs. So the hope being like, maybe if we can find out what is going on in the brain that causes addiction, we can develop some kind of like individual treatment for it and then win the war on drugs without having to change anything structurally about society. Okay, so like... This is what people mean when they talk about the social determinants of health, right? Like if you focus only on individual treatment, you ignore key systemic factors, right? Yes. So during the decade of the brain, Nita is putting out press releases. They're funding a bunch of research. In 1995, one of these press releases says a cure for cocaine addiction is, quote, the biggest need in the country's battle against drugs. End quote. And they think that if they do more experiments with stimulants, which act directly on dopamine in the brain, they can figure out what's going on that causes addiction. By 2000, they put out another press release that says, basically, we think addiction is caused by repeated spikes in dopamine that desensitize the brain to dopamine over time. Mm. Which is interesting because it's like they're using these drugs that act directly on dopamine and then kind of basing this theory of addiction as a whole on that because not all drugs spike dopamine. Right. So we get this sort of oversized emphasis on dopamine in addiction, even though it's an oversimplification. Yeah. And then if you look at what happens in the press after that, dopamine very quickly gets equated to a drug itself. They start writing about dopamine hits and then the idea expands beyond drugs to behaviors like sex and eating, falling in love. So, okay, fast forward to Anna Lemke and the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. She is running the addiction medicine clinic at Stanford. She also is on the board of Physicians for Responsible Opioid Prescribing, which is an advocacy group that's done a lot of work to basically make opioids harder for pain patients to get. So the chronic pain community is aware of her. Very much not fans. Mm -hmm. There's a quote from a TED Talk Lemke did in 2017 that I think is a really good example of the major themes across her work. She said, quote, can we bring back narratives from 150 years ago? People are resilient. The body can heal itself. Pain is inevitable and can serve a useful purpose in our lives, end quote. So we're all getting soft. We need to suffer more. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, it's so Calvinist. Oh. And I think it's really interesting to look at her first book, Drug Dealer MD, from 2016. She argued that the opioid crisis was caused by big pharma, of course, but also doctors who were like too nice. She talks about like narcissistic injuries and and stuff. Like she psychoanalyzes like why doctors were over prescribing sort of. Mm -hmm. Um, And she also says there's this culture of like quick fixes to people's problems. And to be fair, she does say the opioid crisis was a symptom of a failing system. But then at the end of the book, she says the solution is just to train doctors to treat addiction better 
federally funded addiction medicine fellowships, like the one that she runs at Stanford, and find some way for doctors to spend more time with their patients so they're not forced to just fall back on prescribing drugs. But Mm -hmm. that's also never going to happen in a system where healthcare is a commodity and hospitals are for profit businesses because time is money, you know? So I think like what really frustrates me about Lemke's work is that she sort of like gestures at systemic material problems, but then she always ends up giving psychological or like otherwise individual solutions. Instead of like really focusing on the systemic problems. Yeah. And it's so frustrating to see something that's so obviously systemic, like people injure themselves at work. Mm-hmm. They can't live if they're not working. Mm-hmm. They don't have any protections to actually give them time to heal. So, of course, they end up seeking out pharmaceutical solutions, like the entire system's designed to incentivize that. Mm-hmm. So I keep coming back, Jesse, to something you wrote in your Dopamine Dispatches series Quote, if productivity is the soul of dopamine fasting, drug addiction is the conceptual skeleton that holds the whole thing up, end quote. And we've talked in previous episodes, for example, our episode on athleisure with Anne Helen Peterson about productivity and optimization as 21st century catchwords. But something we've never really dipped into before is our cultural conceptual framing of drug addiction particularly that profoundly individualizing impulse to make addiction like a function of brain chemistry rather than talking about structural factors. So can you talk a little bit more about what we culturally in the West think about drug addiction? Yeah, I do think that optimization and productivity are a big part of it because of this like neoliberal turn that happened in the 80s you know everything got privatized and our bodies are now like we're all little entrepreneurs (laughs) of our own health yeah but the idea of like addiction as a brain disease goes way back actually I've been reading a lot of drug historians to try to understand this and you know our modern conception of addiction as like a loss of control caused by substances is actually fairly new it came around like the end of the 1800s the concept is a modern thing. And the temperance movement is kind of like the f- most famous example from this period in America. Uh, and some people say that they viewed alcoholism as a personal moral failing, and they did, but they also saw it as like a disease that was caused by alcohol. So the moral and the medical sort of coexisted there. And the historian Nancy Campbell actually has a book about drug abuse research in the US called Discovering Addiction. And she traces the chronic relapsing brain disease frame back to the 1930s when the U.S. government actually funded what they called narcotic farms. What? Where they would lock drug users up and like rehabilitate them. But really, they were using them for research. Oh, my God. And Campbell has this quote from FDR who wrote in a 1933 letter saying he was really stoked the government was able to fund these narcotic farms so that, quote, victims of the opium habit will be restored to usefulness, end quote. Usefulness. I love a sinisterly capitalist way to talk about humans. Yeah, usefulness is definitely like the key word there. And I think everyone should hold that in their minds because we're going to come back to it. We really are. And we're going to talk a lot more about capitalism and its role in all of these conceptions. But I have one last little piece of context that I want to add in here just to, you know, flush out our why this, why now for dopamine. So I was reading more and more about the mainstreaming of neuroscience and I found myself wanting like a little bit of a why that, why now? Like how did neuroscience get so mainstream in general? And in the process of trying to understand that, I found a 2012 piece in The New Yorker by NYU cognitive science professor Gary Marcus called Neuroscience Fiction. So this is 2012. This is before dopamine fasting goes mainstream, but obviously after the decade of the brain. Uh And it turns out that sort of around 2012 is another moment of cultural concern over the widespread oversimplification of neuroscience. There's like a whole sort of group of people who identify as neuroskeptics 
and are like really critical of the way neuroscience is becoming this sort of simplistic explainer for everything about humans. Uh And Dr. Marcus's argument is that it has a lot to do with the rise of fMRIs and their ability to make very pretty pictures of brains lighting up when we do different things. And those pictures, he argues, quote, lulled people into a false sense of comprehension, end quote. So, Marcel, would you read a little bit more from Marcus for us? I sure will. Quote, as the philosopher Alva Noe wrote, it is easy to overlook the fact that images made by fMRI and PET are not actually pictures of the brain in action. End quote within a quote. The quote continues. Instead, Brain images are elaborate reconstructions that depend on complex mathematical assumptions that can, as one study earlier this year showed, sometimes yield slightly different results when analyzed on different types of computers, end quote. Okay, hold on. Wait. Whoa. (laughs) Okay. Whoa. FMRIs are not a picture of your brain. They're like an artist's rendering of your brain based on mathematical calculations. Yeah, it's like a mass interpretation. Okay, but math very famously has like two plus two always equals four. And what Gary Marcus is saying is that different computers will churn out different images. And so people are mistaking fMRIs for precise images of the brain, but they're actually just representations. They're not two plus two equals four. They're like a vibe. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And the colors also I've read like, having really bright colors makes it look like there's really big differences, but the math is like super, super tiny numbers, actually. They just use bright colors so you can see it better, but it gives this illusion like, oh, there's something really big happening here. They're like, look at this lighting up the dopamine in your brain, right? We all hear Mm -hmm. this, it lights up the dopamine in your brain. Nothing light related is happening. They are using colors to indicate the numbers that they are finding And those numbers, as is the case for any complex experiments, those numbers shift depending on how you interpret them. Mm -hmm. So it's purely interpretive. Also, some of the neuroscientists I read are like, actually, we probably just are currently putting way too much stock in neurotransmitters in general because we can quote unquote see them and that actually neurons are the important thing, but we have no way of seeing neurons so we can't talk about what they're up to so we're just going to talk about neurotransmitters because we can measure them and we fucking love things we can measure well that's a really good point about how like technology has a huge influence on science and then also how what we believe about ourselves because we're able to look at these things because of certain technologies yeah that doesn't mean it's like the ultimate truth it's just what we can do Exactly. And while lots of neuroscientists have been trying to rein in these misunderstandings, the misunderstandings have continued to escalate, fueled by flashy media headlines, which, you know, have a tendency to really oversimplify actual scientific findings. And then like the dubious public scholarship of neuroscientists like Lemke and Andrew Huberman. Okay, so Riddle me this, folks. What does a fixation on the perfectibility of the body, an insistence that health is an individual problem and responsibility divorced from social factors, the fetishization of scientific knowledge as objective and transparent, and a dismissal of those who are inadequately productive as free riders on society have in common? (laughs) Okay. I'm not even going to guess because I believe in my heart that you're going to tell us in the next segment. I'm going to try. And this is it. This is the next segment. It's called The Theory We Need. And Hannah, I think we need some theory. Oh, I couldn't agree more. So it's important to me to note that all of the theory that I have drawn in here came via my close and extensive reading of Jesse's work on dopamine addiction and ableism. So even when I am taking the lead, it's truly a deeply collaborative segment. I love collaboration. Me too. And why don't we start off in a collaborative spirit with you telling me what you remember about the Protestant work (laughs) ethic? (laughs) Okay, so what I think I understand about the Protestant work ethic is that as long as you 
work hard and seek to do good, you will be rewarded after death by going to heaven. (laughs) So it doesn't really matter how hard life is because life is just one stop along the way to the incredible hereafter. But the only way you can get to the incredible hereafter is if you like really pull up those bootstraps and just suck it up and fucking do it. Okay, I'm going to clarify the theology and then, Jesse, I'm going to hand it over to you to historicize the the author. So theologically, what's really key about Calvinism, which is the form of Protestantism that the Protestant work ethic is referring to, this is a concept that comes from German sociologist named Max. I call him Max Weber because I am English. So What's really key about Calvinism is this belief in predestination. So as a like way of rejecting Catholicism and the model of being able to buy your way into heaven, essentially via indulgences, the Calvinists are like, no, you can't buy your way into heaven. Actually, nothing you do on earth can change God's mind about whether or not you are saved. God has already decided in advance who is saved and who is not. And so if you are one of the saved and you believe you are one of the saved, it is your job on earth to act as though you are already saved. And so you are constantly trying to perform being good while also doing this sort of intense inward self-evaluation, looking for signs that you are saved. So like, If you are lazy, if you don't feel like working, that is a sign coming from within you indicating that you are not a recipient of God's grace. Because if you were a recipient of God's grace, you would love working hard. And so we get the rise of autobiographical traditions. We get the rise of this kind of like self-evaluation as part of a spiritual tradition. And we get this very strong idea that liking work and not liking sinful, pleasurable things is a sign that you are an inherently and intrinsically good person. And Max Weber is like, hey, that got along really well with capitalism, huh? Yeah, and also like your success in business was supposedly like a sign that you were on the list to get into heaven if you like were wealthy and made a bunch of money. Yeah, American entrepreneurs like an industrialist really take this up to be like, yeah, actually, if my business is successful, it means that God chose me. So the richer I am, the more chosen I am. Okay. So Max Weber, he wrote The Protestant Work Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, which like everybody learns in Sociology 101, I have read. I didn't take that, but... <laughs> me neither. And he comes actually from a Protestant family in Germany, a wealthy Protestant family. And he actually was trying to provide an alternative theory to Marx, where Marx was like, this is where capitalism came from. He was focusing mostly on like economic stuff. And Weber was like, well, Marx didn't focus on the cultural enough. And so he was more of an idealist. He was like, let's look at the ideas first, not the like material conditions. And there's this book called Weber, Sociologist of Empire. That's really good by Kieran Allen. And He writes that Weber, quote, leaves out the brutal role of force in accumulating capital and imposing new disciplines on labor and in subjecting the colonies to the economic needs of the metropolitan countries, end quote. So criticisms to keep in mind about Weber, he wasn't wrong to connect Protestant values with capitalism. Protestants are very good business people, Um, (laughs) but he was wrong to attribute capitalism's origins like entirely to those ideas. Yeah. So he's both like getting at something cultural that really sort of contributes to capitalism. And also there's kind of this idea of like, wow, everybody just spontaneously embraced capitalism because of their Calvinist ideology, as though like the rise of capitalism didn't involve a lot of violence. Mm. Yeah. I know we're pressed for time, but is it okay for me to ask what hedonic Calvinism is, please? Yes. So that's a term I got from a 1997 paper by George F. Koob, who was for a time the director 
of the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. And he also appears in the bibliography of Dopamine Nation. So I was kind of like digging through that to see like, you know, what are these influences mm-hmm. here? And hedonic is just like a big word for something that has to do with pleasure. Mm-hmm. So Coop thought pleasure was a limited resource in the brain that you could use up if you weren't careful. Mm-hmm. And so in his paper, he calls it hedonic Calvinism. Like it's a biological Calvinism that's like a fact about the human brain. Gotcha. Yeah. And I was really interested in that because I've found Lemke did like a bunch of interviews with pastors. Christian pastors loved Dopamine Nation. And in this one interview I found, she tells this pastor like, you know, neuroscience is confirming now what the Bible has been teaching us about pleasure all along. Yeah. (laughs) Which is like, it shows us that actually pleasure is really bad for you, just like the Bible says. Yeah. But couldn't you also just like be seeing your own morals in that science? Shocking. As well? Absolutely (laughs) not. Science is objective and neutral. (laughs) So the Protestant work ethic and it's you know, belief that the desire to work hard is a sign of grace and will be rewarded in this life with wealth and happiness and in the next with salvation has obviously taken a deep hold in the Western psyche. Like lots of people believe without understanding the history or ideological underpinnings that work is inherently virtuous and that a desire not to work hard or worse yet, an inability to work hard is a moral failing. People really believe this like really deeply. And this belief that people hold deeply and often uncritically is also one that slides very quickly and easily into eugenics, i.e. the idea that humans can be perfected by cleansing the gene pool. Hannah, surely you will walk us through the connection between the Protestant work ethic and eugenics. I will try and I will attempt to do so via an excellent book, also recommended by Jesse in their newsletter called Health Communism, A Surplus Manifesto. I was delighted to come across this book, which is by Beatrice Adler Bolton and Artie Vierkant, who are the co-hosts of a podcast called Death Panel, which friend of the podcast Zena Sharman has recommended to me many times. But I don't listen to smart podcasts. I listen to goofy podcasts. But I will read the smart <laughs> book. And I did. So their book brings together critiques of how capitalism frames health with their call for, as the title says, something that they are conceiving of as health communism. And what that entails is a radical transformation of how we think about health as a site of individual striving that can never be fully achieved because the logics of capitalism demand a constant striving for more. So you're never healthy enough. You always have to be improving yourself. And so... Under Calvinism, it's not enough to be a billionaire. You also have to be immortal in order to prove that you are saved and will go to heaven. Yeah, that if you are really, I mean, you know, you never have to go to heaven if you can live forever in your perfect society that you build with your cyber body. So one of the most interesting things that health communism articulates for me is how capitalist states like, for example, the U.S. can at once pride themselves on their technological advancements in fields like pharmaceutical medicine, while also readily subscribing to eugenicist practices. So it's like, if you're so technologically advanced, shouldn't you be using your fancy medicines to make people healthier so that you have more workers to contribute to the economy? Like, then why is it a problem if people need or want drugs? Wouldn't that be fine if it made them more productive? So Adler, Bolton, and Vierkant address this seeming tension by distinguishing between capitalism's treatment of workers and what they call surplus populations um, and treating those as distinct categories. Jesse, could you read this definition of the surplus population for us? Sure. Quote, the surplus or surplus populations can therefore be defined as a collective of those who fall outside of the normative principles for which state policies are designed, as well as those who are excluded from the attendant entitlements of capital. It is a fluid and uncertifiable population who in fact should not be rigidly defined for reasons we discuss below. Crucially, this definition also elides traditional left conceptions of the working class or the worker, as we will describe at length throughout the health communism, 
the idea that the worker is not a part of the surplus populations, yet faces constant threat of becoming certified as surplus, is one of the central social constructions wielded in support of capitalist hegemony, end quote. Okay, so you work hard to maintain your status as a worker, lest you slide into the category of the surplus, who are no longer useful to capitalism and thus no longer worth being allowed to live, being kept alive, having access to life. Yeah, like no longer worth the state spending any money keeping you alive. So think of the distinction for example, made in North America at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic lockdowns between essential workers Uh who literally workers and like need to be kept alive because they're producing useful labor for the state and that category of people with pre-existing conditions like the elderly or the chronically ill. So one group it's worthwhile for the state to keep alive because they're performing a useful economic function, while the other was tacitly categorized as disposable, according to the eugenicist logics of public health policy. They weren't producing anything useful, so it was not economically worth it for the state to try to keep them alive. And politicians actually said things like, well, the people who are most affected are the elderly, as though they don't have fucking grandmothers. Like, horrifying statements. So the catch, though, is that, like, The surplus is also not like exempt from generating capital. So the surplus population is still made profitable regardless of the fact that they don't have like labor power. In the book, they coin this term extractive abandonment, which describes how the state creates markets around the surplus population. So like nursing homes for the elderly, long-term care facilities, prisons, all very profitable enterprises that rely on this surplus population at the center. They call it, quote, pathologizing with one hand while generating capital with the other, end quote. And they didn't like explicitly write about COVID in the book because they said that it was just like kind of a continuation of the status quo. It wasn't really anything new. So in a nutshell, the surplus is framed as a burden on the workers and then the conversation kind of becomes like, what does this population deserve? Because they're not working. They're just like taking your hard-earned tax money, you know? And like, they're malingerers. Uh, yeah, like you don't want to be a burden like those people. So you better like work hard on your health. You better get into like cold plunging and like <laughs> whatever. You better make sure like you've done everything you can to deserve your health care and like your housing, your like clean air even. In 2020, a lot of the anti-vax wellness influencers, Naomi Klein talks about this in Doppelganger, they were putting out videos like, I don't need the vaccine because I work hard on my health. Like, I'll be fine. You know, implying that people who were getting sick and dying were, they just hadn't worked hard enough to deserve to live, right? Right. I am famously cold-hearted and I feel like if I am needing a moment to just like take a pause and digest this information, probably a lot of our much kinder, gentler listeners out there are probably also maybe at this point being like, this is more than I signed up for in this episode about dopamine. (laughs) Sorry, guys. It was actually about eugenics. So I just want to name like, hey, 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 pals, do you need to take a little break? You go right ahead because we're going to have to plow through and your feelings are legitimate and valid. You're allowed to step away. It's okay. And with that pause, there's simply no time. So how do we tie in drugs, okay? Is it just about people living with addiction not being productive enough? Because like earlier you were talking about banning cocaine, but I know a lot of tech bros use a lot of cocaine. So like what's, uh, there's got to be some eugenics in here too, right? Oh yeah, always. So so it's a tension I find really fascinating. Adler Bolton and Veer can't explain that the historical role of pharmaceutical companies especially in the U.S., has been to make people productive for the sake of capitalism. Mm -hmm. So the pharmaceutical advancement of the U.S. was literally framed by politicians during the Cold War as a way of fighting against the global spread of communism. So health, like at a population level, like people in capitalist countries live longer, is taken as a sign of capitalism's success, while health at an individual level becomes a sign of individual success under the logics of capitalism. 
So capitalism can take responsibility for how well the population is doing, but you individually are responsible for how well you're doing. Because if you're motivated to do well, to take care of yourself, it's because capitalism motivated you to do so. But the state control of health via the pharmaceutical industry really hinged on the state controlling access to drugs through the categorization of drugs as either licit or illicit. So the ones that you are allowed to use to become a better, more productive worker and a sign of capitalism's thriving, and the ones that are illegal and are a sign of moral failing. And particularly those illegal drugs were, during the Cold War, being framed as a specifically communist threat to capitalist success. I absolutely love the idea of some drugs being communist. Marcel, would you please read this longish excerpt from Health Communism about drug use? Yes. Quote, the anti-communist hysteria in the United States mobilized explicitly toward the designation of illicit drugs as a social and political menace would quickly lead to pathologization and explicit calls for the extractive abandonment of drug users and their demarcation as surplus. This pathologization was used to great effect to police and incarcerate members of the surplus populations at a time when anti-colonial, anti-racist, and leftist sentiment was high in these communities. Drug use was invoked as an inherent pathology in language that recalls the rhetoric mobilized against the ill, the disabled, the mad, and the paupers of prior centuries. So here, within the quote, we're quoting historian Susanna Rice, addiction, then, is a disease of high social contagion that not only may produce criminality, but also tends to attack those persons whose resistance to antisocial activity is, for a multitude of reasons, notoriously low. End a quote within the quote. As Rice notes, this rhetoric and the escalation of disciplinary control over newly illicit drugs dramatically escalated policing through the 1950s, as well as incarceration, marking a significant development in the shape of contemporary American racial capitalism. The Boggs Act of 1951, for example, was an early statute passed in a wave of legislative activity defining carceral preferences toward illicit drug use. The Boggs Act established the first mandatory minimum sentencing, which persists to this day as a principal tool of state subjection fueling mass incarceration, end quote. Holy shit. Yeah. So inventing a category of illegal drugs becomes a major state technology for incarcerating potentially resistant populations. There was also famously like what a Nixon aide admitted that the war on drugs was just about like policing black communities and communists. Yeah. Yep. A hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. So it's all like this, you know, it's eugenicist, it's capitalist, and it's entangled in anti-Black racism in particular, in colonialism, in ableism. All these things, the way that we treat drugs and addiction and health is very broken. So yeah, framing some drugs as illicit became another way the state could control the surplus. Also, justifying mass incarceration as a way of like protecting the rest of society, which brings us to another question. How does a neurotransmitter that your brain makes, like dopamine, start to get framed as an illicit drug responsible for all of our contemporary social woes from porn and masturbation addictions to chronic depression? Oh, Jesse, thank you so much for setting me up for what's going to be a longish thesis. <laughs> <laughs> in our final segment in this essay, I will, Hannah will bring together the material conditions of our object of study and our theoretical framework to articulate a thesis statement that, at a glance, is going to require some unpacking. You better believe it. Capitalism has a complex ideological relationship to drugs and health. On the one hand, advanced pharmaceutical breakthroughs have long been treated as a marker of capitalism's superiority to communism, a kind of lifespan-based human race unfolding alongside the space race as the U.S. and the USSR battled through the Cold War to see whose ideology would win out. 
At the same time, reliance on drugs is framed as a failure within the logics of capitalism, especially neoliberal capitalism, in which perfect health is both a demand and an impossible goal kept constantly out of reach. Biohackers and anti-drug self-improvement influencers, then, are two sides of the same coin, both arguing for the perfectibility of the human body under the logics of capitalism, both locating the responsibility for health within the individual and positioning drugs as a technology of personal management and optimization. If drugs equal technological advancement equals capitalist success, then problems with drugs, addiction in particular, must be an individual's failing. The perfect capitalist subject is master of both themselves and their environment, technologies included. Our current cultural fixation over dopamine as a drug your brain produces that some people are inherently biologically more likely to crave is about distinguishing yourself as someone who can control drugs, even the ones your own body produces. Entangled in this anxiety about individualism and technological advancement are the deep Calvinist logics of industrial capitalism as expressed through self-improvement and wellness culture. The theological premise of predestination, as Max Weber explains, is easily absorbed by industrial capitalism into a notion that the desire to work hard is a sign you are already saved. Within the Calvinist and capitalist logics of asceticism and predeterminism, Anything pleasurable that stands in the way of perfect productivity is suspicious. The need for sleep, non-reproductive sex, idleness, and pleasure all become boogeymen of capitalist damnation, impulses that must be rooted out and destroyed. In contemporary rising grind discourse, the inward examination central to Calvinism has extended to an absurd degree through tracking technologies and the temptingly bright colors of fMRIs that seem to offer, at last, a fully objective way to measure what we're actually made of. In this essay, I will... Okay, wait, wait. This is too much for my brain. <laughs> we have to talk about this. <laughs> so I come back to... Where did I encounter these discourses and why was I convinced by them? Uh -huh. Because I have absolutely heard the like, oh, the ADHD brain doesn't produce enough dopamine. And so people with ADHD can't like actually motivate ourselves to do things if they don't produce dopamine. And so like we're easily distracted. We're distracted by bright colors. Like people, I'm saying we, I have never been diagnosed with a goddamn thing. Self-diagnosis counts. And, you know, this idea that, for example, people with ADHD are more likely to develop a sugar addiction because we're like looking for easy external sources of dopamine. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's like one. That's not how dopamine works at all. Like just mm -hmm. just got, got to throw that out. But like lots of these wellness influencers are like, yeah, I know this isn't actually how dopamine works, but it's a useful shorthand for something I believe to be true, which is that any failures of productivity are your own brain's fault and need to be fixed by you. And that discourse is one that has worked really effectively on me personally, for sure. Like productivity discourse. And I need to do some of this like historicizing and unpacking to get at why it's like, actually a deeply troubling idea hmm. i call it a mythos because it, it is like a grand narrative mm -hmm. and i think some of it also is like a lot of people are not really as religious now as like historically we have been but we still need myths so you know it's like a rational science myth yeah mm -hmm. and it ties a lot of stuff together and also kind of like obscures a lot of things all of this like history and all of these politics yeah. And part of the work this myth does is provide a way for individuals to make themselves safe from the horrors of capitalism that we can't help but see unfolding around us. And so it becomes a like, oh, how do I keep myself from becoming part of the surplus? Like, that is my mate, right? Because like, we are workers. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So how do we ensure that we never slide into the surplus? Here are a set of practices you can use that will keep you safe from 
this terrible fate. And that also has like a deeply Christian logic to it. Like, be careful, you might end up in hell. It's just that hell now is on earth and it's invented by capitalism. I think one of the things that this has me thinking about is the number of people with ADHD diagnoses constantly increasing, right? And along with all of these like pop science ways to manage and navigate your ADHD and stuff. If so many people are neurodivergent, what's neuronormative? On the one hand, it feels like we're getting further and further away from a clear sense of who and what counts as neuronormative, but without actually changing our cultural narratives about neuronormativity. Like I keep waiting for the other shoe to drop and for us to be like, actually, there is no such thing as neuronormative. There are a certain set of neuro needs and those neuro needs have happened to influence the economic system, the social system that we all live with. And so we've started calling those normal. And then everything that deviates from that, we call divergent. But that doesn't seem to be the discourse, right? The discourse is always like, oh, well, now we need to think about why all these people are neurodivergent. Why do we have so many people with ADHD? Instead of like, we've created the system that only a few people are able to thrive in. And we're just starting to recognize all of the ways that everybody else is struggling But we're pathologizing that struggle instead of recognizing it as an inherently oppressive system. Yeah. You know, it's the the social theory of disability, right? It's only a problem for somebody not to be able to use stairs if you put stairs in front of every building. Like you've created a barrier to access. So it's this like we need a language of aberration from the neurotypical to explain why like almost nobody can achieve according to the logics of late capitalism. There's a really good book also I will recommend called Empire of Normality by Robert Chapman. And they talk about how capitalism is getting more overstimulating all the time. So like more and more people are becoming like less able to deal with that and becoming like disabled. And I think that self-control is like a huge part of all of this because it's like what's neurotypical is like if you can adequately control yourself so like you know you can like do all these things in moderation and you can like filter out all the stimuli and you can also be like a flexible worker so like you can't like need too much routine because now the economy is just kind of like all over the place and you know every job application is like we need a flexible reliant worker who's always in a good mood Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. (laughs) neurotypical is this ideal um that i don't think most of us can meet no you know i i think a lot about the need to pursue diagnosis in the first place is attached like according to a lot of even policies in canada and the u.s is attached to your ability to work a full-time job So like, you're not disabled if you can work a full-time job. It doesn't matter what's going on with your brain as long as you are still able to produce for capitalism. It's if and when you can't, that it's like, oh, you're a problem now. Let's figure out how to fix you so you can get back to being productive. And that's like a logic I think a lot of us have just just internalized. You brought up the social model of disability and... I feel like I used to be very like, oh, it's all social, like, you know, let's stop talking about the medical model. Like it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with biology, but I now like don't really think that they're totally at odds. And I don't think the problem is whether it's like biology or social because it is both. And I think about this quote from Mark Fisher, where he was talking about serotonin, because like before dopamine, it was serotonin. That was the neurotransfer that everyone was talking about. And he says, like, paraphrasing, but he says, like, even if serotonin, low serotonin does cause depression, then we have to ask, like, why do all these people have low serotonin? And that's like a political and a social question. Yeah. In the same way that, like, we have to ask, like, why are so many people in so much pain that they need to pursue pain management? Why are so many people so totally overwhelmed and distracted that they feel, you know, unable to get anything done. The insistence at the end of the day that it must be you, you are bad. Something about you specifically is bad. 
is a very useful myth for capitalism. I confess I was having some difficulty at the outset of our episode because I have a really complicated relationship to Big Pharma because one, like we know Big Pharma exists. Like Big Pharma is, Mm -hmm. it's an industry designed to make money. It's like drugs cost money and they make money and these are medications that people need. But also over prescribing to make money is also a real thing. And so it's sort of like trying to train myself out of the kind of binaries that are, I think, inherent in this like Calvinist worldview, right? That like, well, big pharma is bad because all drugs are bad. And if you need drugs, then you are bad. But like some of these drugs literally save people's lives. Yeah. I don't know. And it is, I feel like on the, like leftists, we make fun of the big pharma because it's like such a conspiracy on the right now. Like, oh, big pharma. Like I made that joke about like government medicine or whatever. But like it is a problem, you know, like there are lots of things that we need to critique about big pharma. But it, that's why I love health communism. They focus on like how the f- industry like globally changes the way that states work. Like that whole chapter, they talk about how like the industry sort of forced the American government to like go into other states, other like countries and like privatize their health insurance and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. It's a really big part of the argument in health communism is like that big pharma becomes a major part of how the U.S. gains global control over the like medical industry. And like We really saw that during the pandemic around the development of vaccines. And this is, again, a point that Naomi Klein makes to Doppelganger, which Coach has teased me for quoting too much. But she makes this point that, like, we got, like, people on the left in North America got really fixated on countering vaccine resistance and the sort of eugenicist logics of anti-vaxxers and that actually the more productive Marxist focus should have been on global vaccine access. Like we should have been protesting the fact that globally people were not getting vaccines. And the reason they weren't getting vaccines is because pharmaceutical companies developed them and then owned the patents to them. And like it should be illegal to own the patent to a life-saving vaccine. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's the real material problem is like, why can't we afford these and yeah have the drugs that we need oh yeah. god guys the answer is so often capitalism 99.9 times out of 100 i got 99 problems and capitalism is most of them material girls is a witch please production and is distributed by acast Head over to ohwitchplease.ca to get your daily dose of dopamine by checking out the rest of our episodes, as well as our transcripts and reading lists. Plus, our merch is guaranteed to boost your brain's serotonin production at least as much as a cold shower. On our website, you can also learn more about our other two shows, Gender Playground, a podcast about the joys of gender-affirming care for kids, and Making Worlds a video podcast about sci-fi, fantasy, and the radical power of imagining otherwise. Again, you can find out about all of our shows at ohwitchplease.ca. We have an excellent newsletter at ohwitchplease.substack.com and an even better Patreon at patreon.com slash ohwitchplease. And of course, we are on Instagram, X, and threads at ohwitchplease and on TikTok at ohwitchpleasepod. Jesse. Where can people find out more about your work? They can subscribe to my newsletter at sluggish.xyz. And I also just started making video essays on YouTube. And you can find me there as Slugtown. And I'm also on TikTok as Slugtown. Slugtown is so good. Thanks to Auto Syndicate for the use of our theme song, Shopping Mall. And of course, thanks to the whole Witch Please Productions team, our digital content coordinator, Gabby Iori. Our social media manager and marketing designer, Zoe Mix. Our sound engineer, Malika Gampankum. And our executive producer, Hannah Rehack, a.k.a. Coach. At the end of every episode, we will thank everyone who has joined our Patreon or boosted their tier to help make our work possible.
Patreon support is the way we pay our incredible team. So when we say thank you, we really mean it. You make this show possible. Our enormous gratitude goes out to Rachel H., Jordan H., Katie S., Valerie M., Stephanie D.L., Claire S., and Jessica W. We'll be back next episode to tackle a whole new piece of pop culture through a whole new theoretical lens. But until then... Later, neurotransmitterators. Oh.